Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Noe Lani Pearl Hunt, and I'm the interim CEO of Hand in Hand Parenting. I'm so excited to get to know you today. Parenting is the most important role and the most rewarding role that I have, and I bet it is for you too. What if it was just a little bit easier? The Hand in Hand Parent Club gives advice, support, and caring for the most for the toughest and most important role that you have. Today, we are launching the Hand in Hand Parent Club. In a few minutes, we will give you a preview of the personal support that you will receive with the Facebook Live question and answer. Before that, let me tell you a little bit about the Parenting Club. It's a membership that gives you the absolute best information we have to offer, delivered to your inbox every week with the added support of weekly coaching through Facebook Live and phone calls, a supportive parenting community, and free access to our Setting Limits and Building Cooperation courses, and question and answer sessions with Patty Whiffler, the founder of Hand in Hand. And it's all accessible right there on your phone. Now for what you've been waiting for. Patty Whiffler developed a revolutionary parenting approach based on a fresh understanding of the way relationships in families affect children's behavior and their ability to learn. She founded the nonprofit Hand in Hand Parenting in 1989, helping thousands of families over the last 30 years. And now I'm going to have Patty join us. Hi, Patty, how are you? Hello, Lonnie. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Great, great. We're happy to have you. Um, so, why don't we start with our first question? So the first question that we have is, what would you tell parents who are new to hand in hand about the um, hand in hand techniques? Okay, um, I think the first thing to say is that hand in hand exists to support you. Parenting is emotional work. It is very difficult work, and there's very little support for the work of parenting that, that one can rely on as a parent. Um, I found this out as a parent. I saw my parents struggle with really major crises in our family again and again without help. And boy, it is really hard to go through difficult times when you don't have someone to talk to, you don't have someone reliable to help you think about how best to lift difficulties off of your children and out of your family. And um, this really interesting new approach that I sort of helped develop and uncover um, is one that allows us to guide our children effectively without rewards and without punishments, without kind of being the bad guy all the time. Um, play is a part of it, listening is a part of it, setting limits is a part of it, um, and really helping children offload the tensions that they carry so they can think better again. So what we're about is helping parents get the emotional support they need to relax in their children's presence, to have fun with their children, to connect with their children, and then to use four other what we call listening tools, special time, play listening, setting limits, and stay listening, um, interchangeably and in concert to connect with their children again and again and to help their children offload the tensions that turn into or that actually drive off-track behavior, that turn into non-cooperation, defiance, aggression, not being able to sleep, not being able to get to school in the morning, not being able to eat a meal without hopping up and down and running around the house. Um, all, of these, all of these difficult times that wear on us as parents can be resolved when we use these four listening tools with our children and when we get enough good listening support for ourselves so that our attention level lowers as well as our children's. Um, really, we need to kind of put the oxygen mask on ourselves first before we can do things differently and in a more connective way with our children. So I think our message is you're a good parent, but under a lot of stress. And your children are good children, but when things don't go well, it's stress that's bothering them too. And so our approach values um, allowing us to have a good cry, have a good tantrum, to vent 
all the feelings that collect because we love our children so much and because the work is difficult um, and poorly supported. And then we can turn and allow our children to vent some of the upsets that they have so that they feel closer to us and we, we can really connect with them in a very deep way. So those are the first things. You're good, your child is good, and they really want to cooperate. Um, they really want to be in close with you. Those are the main messages for today, I think. That's great. Um, I have a bunch of questions from parents all over the world, and um, I don't think we're gonna be able to get to all of them, but we're gonna try to get to as many as we can. Um, why don't we start with this first question? I'm sure it's a question that everyone has. Um, how do I get my four-year-old son to listen? Nothing works. I've tried timeouts, taking away privileges, etc., until I lose my patience and yell, which I hate, and it doesn't work either, and it just leaves me miserable. Now his two-year-old brother seems to be starting the same path. Okay. Um, the way we see it, and this is, you know, you don't have to take my word for it. Um, experiments are very, very helpful to parents. We kind of have to think of ourselves as learners in this work of parenting. And if what you're doing isn't working, don't do it again. <laughs> you already know it's not going to work. So what but the problem is what to do instead. Um, all of us were raised on the idea that we need to control our children's behavior and that the best levers for control of our children's behavior to get them to act right um, are rewards and punishments. We were all brought up under the rewards and punishments idea, um, and our parents thought that they had to teach us a whole lot of stuff and control our behavior when they didn't like what they saw going on. And um, we think that rewards and punishments are kind of like old Band-Aids. Um, that you, you might try to solve a problem with a, a reward for good behavior or with a disincentive or a punishment for bad behavior. But when you paste that on a child's behavioral difficulty, um, it's just going to peel off. Um, if not in an hour, then in a day or two. And they're going to be going back to the same crazy making behavior um, that made you try to put that Band-Aid on in the first place. So what, what really motivates children, rather than getting stuff or losing stuff, um, what really motivates children is feeling close to us. They want to feel close. They need to feel close. They need to feel included. They need to feel part of the clan. They need to feel um, your approval and your that yet you cherish them. They need to feel seen. They need to feel understood. The human brain is meant for feeling seen, understood, and cared about. And when we feel that, when we feel connected and in close with the people we're with, we can think. Children can think when they feel close to you. When they feel close to you, children can share. When they feel close to you, children can want to help with, you know, cleaning up the, the blocks on the floor. They don't mind at all because it's with you. They're doing it with you. Um, but when children don't feel close and connected, they can't think and they can't cooperate. They can't really, you know, do anything that you want them to do because, they feel your disappointment. They feel your disapproval. This makes them, moves them farther away from you. And they just don't, they, they cannot think what to do. They can't think how to get reconnected. So really it's the parent's job to connect at that point. When your child is, you know, not able to do what needs to be done, um, connection is the answer. And when you connect with a child who feels disengaged, um, you know, not connected with you, not in love with you, when you connect with them, emotional tension is going to squirt out. There's going to be some laughter, which is great and fun, or there may be some tears, or there may be a huge tantrum. These things are good. The tantrums, the tears, and the laughter um, even when it goes on a long, long time, is deeply healing to a child if you can listen, if you can stay present with them and figure that this is a healing process and I'm going to assist it. So if you listen, you're pouring in your caring 
You're pouring in respect for them and their process. You're pouring in your understanding that once they clear their mind of all the upset that's been backed up in there for a while, they'll be able to think and cooperate again. So, um, so this is what we need to do in order to turn things around in our families. And it starts with special time. Um, just giving a child five minutes of your undivided attention and telling them that that's what's going on. Okay, we're going to try doing special time. We've never done this before, but I'm going to set my set the timer. Five minutes. I'll do whatever you want to do. What do you want to do? And then, and you kind of have to have other children, you know, occupied with other things while you do this with one child. Um, in general. When children can kind of sense that special time is going on and you're paying warm, loving attention to one of them, um, they're going to want to, they're going to come in the room. They're going to see what's going on. They're going to put their head in front of your head. So you'll look at them and not their little sister. Um, so they kind of need someone to be with them while you're doing special time with one of your children. And when special time is, and then during special time, you just approve of them. You just let go of your to-do list let go of trying to accomplish anything at all um, that, you know, that has a product. It's like what you're doing is connecting. And the play that your child chooses is just the vehicle for your warmth, um, your tone of voice, your kind eye contact, your interest in them. And special time really, really helps. So uh, here's a little story. Um, there's a mom I know who was dying to go to this, you know, social event with her friends on Friday night and she brought her two children with her and one of the children went off to play with the other kids, but there, her younger child just hung on to her leg and wouldn't let go. She did not want to play with anybody. She wanted to eat, just be with her mom. And what the mom did, rather than get mad at her or say, na 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 or do a bribe or a punishment, um, she just said, okay, I think I want to give you special time here. So I'll do whatever you want for five minutes, you know, and then I'm going to be with the grownups at this party. What would you like to do? And her daughter, who was four years old at the time, said, mommy, I want to make a, a birdie's nest underneath the table. So there's a table with all of the, you know, the appetizers on it, and it had a tablecloth. Uh, that went almost to the ground. And so they crawled together under the table in the middle of the party. And her daughter made a little pretend bird's nest, sat in the bird's nest for a while. And then she told her mom what to say to her and how to take care of the, her, her as a baby bird. And they spent five minutes with her being a baby bird and the mommy bird, you know, feeding her and fixing her feathers. And and um, and and when five minutes was up, her mommy said, "Okay, sweetie, that's five minutes. You know, let's let's go out and see who's there." And her daughter kind of popped out and went off and played with the kids. It was like her clinginess was gone because her mom had connected. She now felt seen. She didn't feel alone anymore. Um, and her, you know, so she could just be confident in herself at this party, not worrying about separation anymore. It doesn't always work that way. This is a family in which special time is a regular thing. And so you don't get miracles in behavior the first time you use special time necessarily, although some people do. Um, so you want to begin with special time. And then use our other listening tools to get laughter going between you and your child, um, to, you know, to set limits. And we'll talk about these other tools as, as I answer the other questions. But really, your first good move will be to find someone to take care of one of your children or, you know, schedule a special time during a nap or, or, you know, a special, you know, some, some activity that they have that really engrosses them so you can do special time with the other. And it doesn't have to be really long, but it needs to be your 100% attention. You do not answer the phone. You do not multitask. You don't pick the lint off the carpet while you're playing Candyland. Um, <laughs> you are really there to connect with your child. Yeah, her, yes. Children's limbic system can tell when you're paying full attention, when you're really there. So you don't want to pick your tiredest moment to do special time and start there and good things will happen. 
Great. Um, well, to continue on with special time, we have someone um, who's watching us with the 52 viewers asking she said my son loves special time but has become used to it when the baby sleeps which means he's going to bed too late during that time i turn off my phone and try to connect but there's no release um he's tired and cranky but no emotions are released when the timer goes off during the day he has a sense of always being upset um aggressive and pouty and uncooperative so she's asking just when can she, when's a good time to do special time? Michelle, how old is your um, son? If you can let us know while Patty starts. Oh, I'm sorry. I was waiting for that information. Okay. Um, let's see if she is still doesn't, watching. It doesn't matter too much how old he is. Sure. So what we like to recommend is something that is um, counterintuitive. It's not something that you're going to think is going to work very well. And as a matter of fact, it may be a little bumpy when you try it, but I think overall it's a good idea. And that is rather than special time before bed, I would move the special time to another time of the day if possible um, or on the weekends. And then before bed, instead of special time, I would try playlist. I would get some kind of rumpus, ruckus, physical play going. Um, because a child who is upset during the day many times is a child who's carrying a lot of emotional load. And children can't sleep on top of an emotional load. It's like sleeping on boulders. Um, they just can't relax. They can't go to sleep. And so what you want to do is give them a bigger invitation or a bigger safe place, a, um, a more obvious safe place to um, first of all, have fun and release some tension with laughter. And second of all, to give them a chance to find a way to get in and release some of the deeper feelings that are sitting there stuck. And play listening is great at this. So, you know, what, one of the things that my kids used to love to do was jump on the bed. And during special, I didn't let them jump on the bed anytime, but during special time, I'm there, I'm watching, I'm keeping things safe, and I figured it was okay. So, you know, you can say, hey, let's do, I don't know, I would call it something. I would call it WrestleMania, or let's do, let's jump on the bed time. And they can jump, and you can admire their jumps, and um, maybe you can try a game at which you lose. So, Oh, let me catch those beautiful feet of yours. Oh, there they are. You know, and you try to touch their feet and they jump out of the way and you try again and again, but they're jumping all over the place and they're getting away every time and laughing and laughing because you're trying to, you know, touch their feet and they are swifter, you know, cleverer, faster, you know, smarter than you are. And so you can just play the less powerful role, giving them lots of chance to laugh. Um, and you set it up for, mm, you know, 10, 15 minutes. This is very active play. Or you could do horseyback rides. And the other thing my kids used to love to do is pay, play bucking bronco. So I get down on all fours. I had knee pads for this to make it easier to play this game. <laughs> and then they'd hop on my back and then I'd try to buck them off. And um, with a child who's scared, you have to do this somewhat carefully. So you do just little gentle bumps and maybe they slide off onto the carpet and laugh and laugh and laugh and then climb back on. Um, but for children who feel pretty confident, you can buck hard and rear up and I don't know. And, and oh my gosh, this rider is so sticky. This is a really sticky one. I don't know how I'm ever going to get him off, you know, and you shake and you rattle and you roll and, and they'll laugh and laugh and laugh and finally fall on the carpet and then just be eager to get back on again. The more laughter you can engender without tickling, um, the more emotional release your child gets. And then when you say, okay, timer's going off, that was our 15 minute WrestleMania time um, or whatever you want to call it, um, they can begin to feel the upset coming closer to the surface because the laughter helped them feel close and connected. The laughter helped them feel emotionally safer. And they can actually share with you some of the deep feelings of disappointment that the day has to end or that this wonderful time with you has to end. So um, you can set a limit there saying, no, we really can't play anymore. And if they keep jumping, then you reach in and you 
you know, give them a corral with your arms and say, I'm, you know, it really is time for bed. And then they can explode with all of the tension that they've been carrying. Um, so I would, I would get something, some kind of really active play in which they can laugh and laugh and you're taking the less powerful role. Um, it's a really good way of helping kids let off steam, helping them feel closer to you, helping them feel deeply hopeful. And when they feel deeply hopeful, um, they can unload some of the hurts that, um, that make the daytime interactions with friends and at school harder. And once you get good, good laughter going, then good tears will follow and your child's behavior is going to begin to go in, in a better direction. Not all the time, off and on, but, but, you know, steadier and steadier in a good direction as you keep this up. I know for me that has been really helpful with, you know, when my daughter, my 22 year old daughter was younger and with my bonus kids, that rough housing and that you know, building of emotion was, has been instrumental in really kind of bonding our families together, but also for them to be able to, to get those feelings out. So it's, it absolutely works. Yeah. Um, we're going to move on to uh, an older uh, child question. And um, I know that a lot of parents have probably been here too. So should I allow my 10-year-old daughter to constantly be rude, undermining, and trying to embarrass me? How do I deal with this? Huh. No, you shouldn't. <laughs> but the usual ways that, I mean, children don't want to be awful. You know, that's just, it's not their nature. This is not your daughter's true nature to be upset with you and attacking you um, in, in public in embarrassing and um, hurtful ways. It's not in her nature. She wants to love you. She does love you. But by the time a child is nine, there are layers of feelings of the, of mom that come from moments that haven't gone well between the two of you for reasons that neither of you could figure out how to help. And those layers kind of got her coated with upset. And she's showing you that upset over and over again. She wants help with that upset. Children don't show upset until they want help with it. And then it kind of squirts out all over. They're just begging for some someone to figure out how to reach out for them. And so what you're going to be doing is reaching for your angry child. We have a booklet on this. It's part of this set of booklets called Listening to Children. Um, and it talks about the kind of anger that comes out in, you know, name calling and attitude and, um, you know, the kind of thing that you're dealing with. And um, it's not easy to be around an angry person. So probably your first step is going to be to find a listening partner or to find someone who can listen to how it feels to be treated this way for you. It's like you don't you don't want to tolerate this kind of treatment because it's not good for you and not good for your daughter. But until you can offload how much it hurts, how frustrated you feel, how sad you feel that it comes to this, you know, between you and her. I'm sure it's not what you imagined parenting was going to be. You know, it wasn't the sweetness that you'd imagined. It wasn't the closeness that you want. And um, we all have big feelings about the times that have not gone well with our child. And so to find a listener who can allow you to talk about where it gets hard and to show the feelings that you carry is going to be a big relief for you. We highly value a deep, good, long sob um, about how hard parenting is and how how far away from what we want it to be it sometimes gets for all of us for me for everyone every one of our teachers it, it's not you know it's just not easy and so having someone listen to your feelings is going to clear some of the emotional burden off of you and make you a little fresher as you reach for your angry daughter and um, I I think, I would start with special time and see if she can take you up on your offer of special time. Um, and with a 10 year old, it needs to be a little longer than five minutes, probably, unless you can only stand five minutes with her, in which case five minutes is. Um, 
but just giving her, you know, free reign in the relationship, giving her control in the relationship will help win her. It'll kind of help open her heart or at least you know, make a little dent. Um, and doing this a little bit of special time day after day is going to be helpful. When she begins to, you know, get into that, you know, full of attitude place, I think the thing to do is to, um, is to get into the same room, to find a comfortable place, to sit down and to say, sweetie, tell me, tell me what happened to make you feel this way. And if you get, um, if you get nothing but attitude back, then I think what you need to say is, I'm going to listen to everything you want to tell me, all of your complaints, and I'm going to listen for five minutes and I'm not going to interrupt you. I just want you to tell me everything that's on your mind because I see you're not feeling good. Don't say any more than that. Don't say, and when you're finished, you, you know, you don't you dare, da, 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 da. Just don't follow it with a threat or anything. Just say, for five minutes, I want to listen to everything on your mind, everything you're upset about. And I'll write things down if you want me to. Sometimes writing things down helps children feel heard. It's like the fact that you're not just sitting there quiet, but that you're making a list is helpful to them. Um, actually, my children remember um, times when I, I <laughs> when they were upset with one another, and I just took them each into the bedroom one at a time and said, "Okay, I'm making a list of all the things you hate about your brother. You know, <laughs> just tell me, tell me the list." And um, they just told me that they had that memory. They both had that memory, um, you know, bright, bright in their minds. And they're 45. That was one of the, <laughs> one of the things they really liked is how that, how that felt. Um, and what you're trying to do is listen long enough that she can finally get to some tears. And what you need to do is not listen with a hard heart. Listen with an open heart. Because something has happened to her that has closed her heart down. And it, it's not, uh, she just doesn't want to be this way, but she doesn't know how to get herself back. And someone needs to listen to the upsets that she's got. So you saying, oh, yeah, you know, it, it must be really hard. Or I'm sorry it's so hard. Or I'm sorry you feel that way. And, but don't say very much. Just really listen. Really give some indication of your caring. Sometimes when children have a long list of grievances about us, um, which they which they do by the time they're ten, um, <laughs> sometimes it, it helps to say something. Not I mean we can't argue back. It's like these are feelings. You cannot argue with feelings. You can't argue with how someone feels, and you can't reach in and change it. All you can do is melt the outer coating of upset and disappointment with your attention and your caring. And one thing that um, I like to say when someone is very, very distant and very, very angry is what I really want is for your life to go well and for you and me to, to be in good with each other. That's all I want. I may not know how to get there, but that's really all I want. And when you say just the right thing, what's going to come back at you, you need to know this. When you say something that is actually reassuring that they, where they, you know, caring was carried into them at least a little bit, what you're going to get back is feelings that get more intense, you know, yelling that gets louder, um, you know, denial uh, that this could possibly be true. And so you're kind of hot on the trail of the, the heated inner core of the feelings that need to be vented um, in order for you and she to, to reconnect when you say something and there's a big fat reaction. So don't think you're on the wrong track when you get an intense reaction. Just, you might try saying it again, sweetie, I just want you to know that I, I love you and, and mad at the world. Um, it's, you know, that state is not a good state for human beings to be in. They don't have a happy time in there. And, but as soon as they begin to cry, you know, you've connected, just stay right there and just keep, keep saying, sweetie, I'm right here. I'm not going to go away. Um, even if she tells you, you know, get out, of, get out. I don't want to be with you. Um, when feelings get really hot, kids get 
You know, they, they don't want to feel as bad as they're going to have to feel in order to show the feelings and relieve themselves of the power of the feelings. So all of this is outlined in our booklet, Reaching for Your Angry Child, and it comes together with the other Listening to Children booklets, which are all about these listening tools. And you're going to need not just the ideas in Reaching for Your Angry Child, you're going to need all of the ideas in order to turn your relationship around. But you can do it. And we have consultants who can help you if you want someone to listen to you and and kind of guide you through this you know, relationship repair process. We have many parents who have been through the same thing and, and know what it's like on the inside who can help. Yeah, and you know, um, not only do we have consultants, but the parent club is kind of about that too. So not only is it about you know getting that support. <laughs> Um, but it's also about connecting parents just like you, Caroline. You know, I, too, had a difficult time connecting with my 22-year-old. And I have to say, you know, like um, Christiane was saying earlier, that special time has really been transformative for me and my daughter. As an adult, you know, we've seen uh, the breaks in our relationship. Um, and it's just, you know, the repairing through that special time. It's been, it's been very, very meaningful, meaningful and really great. So we have a couple other questions from inside the Facebook group. Um, I have one from um, Elena, and she's saying um, she also has issues with her nine-year-old ver um, and verbal aggression and diminishing and disparaging comments with respect to me and his siblings. How do I react at that moment? Okay. Um, when... Children are putting others down in the, you know, in the midst of family togetherness. Um, I think you need to set limits. And when, when it's persistent, when kids are kind of grievancing about their resentments of their siblings over and over and over again, um, one good strategy is, you know, I can see that your siblings are on your, you know, that they're just on your mind and, and irritating you every day. So what I want to do, and sometimes you can, if you have an, a partner who sort of understands this approach or is willing to try it, um, you know, you can say, you know, your other parent and I want to support you. We want to hear everything that's hard about having, you know, sisters and brothers. So every night, right before dinner, it better better before dinner than after because you kind of want to let the feelings be heard before you're trying to be together as a family. You can say your dad and I or your mom and I want to get together and we want to give you, you know, 10 minutes a night to tell us all the hard things that you're thinking about your sisters and your brothers. And it, you might want to bring your list and write things down again. Um, but what's most important is your attention. And this is not to solve a problem. Even if they tell you, you know, she's always, you know, she's always messing with my toys and she's in my room without permission and da, 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 da. And you could say, well, you know, we'll, we'll put a sign on your door and da, 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 da. Don't, don't, don't try to solve it. You can do external solutions, but the feelings inside are going to attach to some other criminal act that brothers and sisters are doing. So it's the feelings that need to be addressed. Not you don't you don't really need to fix anything. What you need to do is find a way to listen. So so for five minutes or ten minutes every night before the family is trying to be together you and maybe your partner go into the bedroom with this child and just say, okay, tell us anything good that happened with your brother and sister today and tell us all the bad stuff you're thinking about. And you just sit and you want to sit and kind of have an expression of caring and warmth. You don't want to sit with a frown on your face going, you know, oh, these really are problems. Boy, this is awful. I, you know, you don't, you, you don't want your demeanor to be agreeing with your child's demeanor. You want to sit there with hope in your heart because you are applying listening, which is a, an invisible but a very powerful tool to this problem of I hate my brother, I hate my sister, and, and most of the time I hate you too. Um, so you're listening. You are looking, you know, you're trying to hold an encouraging demeanor. And in order to do this, you need to be listened to because 
by now this kid is driving you nuts and you need to tell somebody how they drive you nuts and how you never want to hear one more word like this, like all of this stuff that comes out every night. You, you just need to blow up about this particular child and how long this has been going on and express all of the worries that are on your mind about where this is going to lead and you know what kind of a kid is he going to grow up to be. Um, we carry so many fears about our children and we need to let them out with some other grown up so that we can sit peacefully and listen to their grievances and go, okay, we're sorry it's so hard. And then you give your kid, you know, a little ruffle in the hair and maybe you just say, you know, let's have a little cuddle before we go back in. So you apply some closeness. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for telling us the things that are on your mind. We do want it to be better. And when you do that, your child is A, going to feel your attempt to hear. They're going to feel the warmth coming in that they can't feel most of the time. Special time will help. Um, getting, making sure that they get special time as well as their brothers and sisters. Because if their brothers and sisters are thinking more of the time, there's going to be less intrusion on their part into his territory or less they're, they're going to be not kicking him in the shins quite so often with the behavior that they have. So special time all around. And then thank you and uh, yeah, and and there's an article on our website called Bad Words from Good Kids. Um, and I would look at that article and think a, about, you know, just take a look at some of the suggestions about um, responding to verbal, verbal put-downs, responding to kind of nasty language. Um, right now we probably need to move on to another question, but that's a whole very interesting area um, that can be actually lots of fun to work with. Um, it can be hilarious to, you know, to bring a vigorous snuggle or some other playful intervention when a child starts mouthing off. Um, <laughs> they usually respond um, quite well to some humor and some affection at times like that. So. And it's hard to do that, but it does definitely work. <laughs> Yeah. So you're listen, being listened to makes it easier. It's like being listened to makes that a possible experiment. When you're furious, it's an impossible experiment. You just can't do it. You can't even imagine anybody doing it. So Exactly. exactly. Well, um, we have people from all over the world listening. So um, Sarah Wise is listening from Germany, and she would love to have some more tips from um, for school-age children who think that play listening is just not cool. <laughs> oh, interesting. Boy. Um, hmm. I don't, you know, I would say more special time. It's like in, in my, I don't know, in my experience, children are almost always at any age um, glad to see you um, you know, failing where they succeed. <laughs> so <laughs> they, they like being in the, um, in the more powerful role. They like being the swifter, the stronger, the cleverer. And so, but if they are turned off, it may be that, um, you're a little stiff as you play. So I, you know, I mean, that, some of us have not, did not grow up with playful parents and had very little experience kind of, you know, really playing and letting laughter just roll and roll and roll. And so we're, we're kind of a little, a little tight when we play and it's probably the tightness they're reacting to. So, um, so I would say get some listening time about play, your memories of play when you were little, the times you try to play with your child, um, times it succeeded. And, um, I, you know, I think what you want to do is back off from what you have been doing, um, your attempts to do play listening and just watch and see what does make your children laugh because children love to laugh. They really, you know, seek out laughter, but if it's not working for you to try to make play listening happen, then don't try anymore just be an observer and for a week, just watch anything and everything that gets a giggle out of your children. You know, maybe it's videos, maybe it's jokes on TV, 
but just be a scientist, find out what does make your kids laugh, and then see if you can extend that laughter, you know, help it happen, help get one more chuckle out, um, and uh, go from there. You're going to kind of have to back off, watch very carefully, and begin again. Um, I know that it's interesting. Most of the young people that grow up using listening tools, um, by the time they get to, you know, 11 or 12 or 13, what really makes them happy is to do special time and make you look really ugly and foolish and then take you out and parade you up and down the sidewalk with your hair all in braids that stick out all over. Or, you know, if you're a, if you're a guy with, you know, lipstick on and, um, and, you know, jewels around your neck, it's like they will dress you up to look absolutely ridiculous and then take you out um, so that people will see you looking that way and they will laugh and laugh and laugh. They really, they like to work on embarrassment by making us the object of, of embarrassment, by making us look embarrassingly silly. And most of the kids in later, you know, later school years um, get a big kick out of making their parents look weird um, and doing doing their utmost to embarrass us. And as they do, they just laugh and laugh and laugh. So, you know, and you can't really steer things in that direction, but um, that's that's one of the things that I've seen over and over again. I I can't tell you how many parents have sent me pictures of what they looked like after special time when their twelve year olds got a hold of them and you know you know sort of made made their hair do really weird things and put all this gooky makeup all over their faces and um, and laughed and laughed and laughed. So, you know. Great. Well, we are just getting a ton of questions from people in um, our Facebook chat, and I'm going to try to um, get to as many of them as we can. Okay. Um, we have a great one from Elizabeth who says her three-year-old absolutely adores her six-month-old brother, but she's so rough with him at times. She's trying to play, but we're constantly reminding her to be gentle, and she gets frustrated and will hurt him by hitting and pushing and throwing things at him or at us. I'm confident that special time will help her, but what do I say or do in the moment? We currently love her, love her brother from the other room, but it breaks her heart. Yeah. Okay. Um, it is, you've been wise to not let that continue. You know, you've been wise to not let that continue. You don't really want to just hope that a child isn't going to hit or hurt when the last three times or five times or 10 times they've been with their baby brother, they've hurt him. So, What's happening on the inside is that you've got a child who does love her brother, but she's also scared. And as she gets close to her brother, she's expressing the love she has, but that closeness to him somehow ignites the little knot of fear inside of her. And the fear is, you know, this probably something like, I mean, we're never going to know what that fear is, but usually the flavor of it is, this kid is taking all of my parents' attention and I'm not, you know, I'm not the main one anymore. And I want, you know, and that's really, really scary. And so aggression comes out. You don't get aggression unless the child is scared on the inside. And the fear, you know, that they can manage the fear up to a certain point, but then it just leaps out and takes over their brain. In, and it doesn't take more than a tenth of a second for that to happen. So they turn from sweet and loving to, um, you know, little marauders. And what I like to do is to stop warning a child and stop saying over and over again, be gentle, be gentle, be gentle, because you've already seen that that doesn't work. Words do not change a child's behavior unless they can think. And she is subject to not being able to think as soon as she gets close to her baby brother. So her mind shuts down. She can't help it. Words will not help. So I wouldn't warn um, because she can heed the warning until she can't think. And then, you know, it's as if the warning never happened. So what to do instead is to just give her warm support for being as close to her brother as is safe. It's like, oh, you want to see your brother? Okay. And put your hand on her tummy. And so you guide how close to her brother she can get. And I would let her get within an arm's reach, but not any closer. 
So, and it's not, and you can be very, very supportive. You know, your brother loves you and I can see how much you love your brother. Oh, see, look at how he looks at you. And you can be pleased with their interaction and pleased with her. And what's going to happen is as she feels the limit that she can't get any closer, the fear is going to, the safety of that limit, the fact that you are keeping her from being possibly able to hurt him makes, makes the situation safer for her and her, for her feelings, the, the heat of the fear inside is going to come forward and she's going to struggle against you and not like that you're holding her, you know, get your hand away. I want to give him a kiss. I want to give him a hug. And what you can say is, sweetie, you can give him a kiss and a hug, but not yet. I'm going to keep you right here for now. So he stays safe and you stay safe too. And give her eye contact and just be pleased. It's like she's trying to show her love. What comes up instead is all this fear. And she's probably going to fight you, going to start sweating and trembling, going to start crying and screaming. There's not going to be very many tears. This is the way fear releases. And you just want to, you know, allow her to be as close as is safe. Um, allow her to fight against the limit that you've set and allow her to feel all of those heated feelings. She may throw herself on the ground. She may turn her aggression towards you and try to scratch and kick and bite. I mean, the aggression needs to be shown. You need to keep yourself safe and the baby safe. And you need to allow her to go through this whole emotional cleansing process where she shows you how fiercely she's fighting for her, what, you know, whatever, whatever it was that scared her, she's fighting against it now. And she's using you as the stand-in for the thing to fight against. And um, this is all described in our booklet, um, Healing Children's Fears. It's just, there's a whole chapter on healing children's fears in the listen book and we can help you with it in the parent club as well. So, um, it, yeah. Um, and there is a, a couple of, a couple of articles called, um, supporting sibling friendships. I think it's called, um, is one of them. And, um, the other one is what to do about sibling rivalry, I believe. So just, Go to our webpage, type in siblings, and you'll get a couple of articles that describe more of the things you can do to help her offload this fear and help her stay in her right mind as she gets closer. And Velma, who are both on our staff giving answers to some of the questions that we can't get to. Um, so feel free to tag them in your questions, and they'll be able to help you too. Um, I have um, a couple questions that are similar, and I think that I would ask them. So. There, a lot of the theme in regards to cooperation is uh, parents having younger children who have a hard time with either cleaning up, our morning, our bedtime routines, and they're asking, um, number one, how to make it easier, and, and number two, how long does it usually take to get those things to change? Um, some people are working on it for months and just need a, a, just probably a little bit of guidance so that they feel like there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Okay. Okay. Um, there is a light at the end of the tunnel and how long the tunnel is, no one can tell you. One of the things, if we, if we got to, you know, sort of refashion human beings, it would be great to have a, a sort of a dipstick, you know, that you could stick into your child's mind to find out, you know, how big is this upset and how, how many, how long do I have to listen before it's finally drained and over with and healed? And uh, there is no dipstick. For some children, the idea of cleaning up somehow, we do not know how these little connections get made in the brain. But what happens is that children carry emotions from from overwhelming circumstances and interactions that did not go well, that go all the way back to infancy and birth and sometimes, you know, even before birth, hard things happen. And those hard things set in um, fears and other emotions that sit with your child and complicate life um, in mysterious ways. So we don't really know why needing to clean up 
um, has such, you know, children have such a deeply emotional response to it. But there's an article um, on chores. Let me see, I'm looking at the, um, the title of it. Chores, uh, child, it's called Children and Chores, Four Ways to Get Them to Help. And that's on our website. Um, and in the listen book, pages 175 to 179, there's some really good success stories about how parents help their child be able to think about cooperating with chores. But really, it starts with our attitude towards chores. If we have, in our own minds, divided the household tasks into stuff I enjoy doing and stuff I hate to do, and, and I'm calling that stuff chores and I'm going to get somebody else to do it as quickly and as often as I can, then that, that kind of assignment uh, of, you know, a, a negative cast on taking out the garbage or feeding the cat or, you know, picking up the dog poop in the backyard. If you've got a negative, negative cast on a certain kind of work or activity um, and that's going to transmit to your child and they're never going to want to do it. You know, so what we have to do is, is work on our feelings about I never have enough help around here. This house is always a mess. Every time I ask for someone to help, they give me a whole lot of, you know, a whole lot of lip. Um, this is, you know, I just all I want is a little help and I can never get any. We have deep resentments and a lot of big feelings um, in, in particular. Um, because of, you know, it's like the chores in the house have been divided between women and men. Um, often there are men's chores and women's chores, and we, you know, we never get to choose. And there's generations of bad attitudes towards chores that have been passed down to us. So the layer of feelings we carry about chores is actually pretty thick. And in order to win cooperation from our children, we have to get some of that resentment off of our backs. Otherwise, the resentment, you know, kind of flashes at them in our tone of voice and how we look and how we talk about chores. And it's like no human being would want to do that. You know, why, why do I want to do it? Why do you make me do it? Is kind of what our children are getting is, you know, this is not worthy work. And we need to consider all work worthy. Um, and work on our feelings about, you know, work that we don't want to do and don't want to be involved with so we can actually have a better attitude toward chores ourselves. That's actually the beginning of healing the troubles around chores. Um, and another one is just being able to be playful. Um, so I'll just give an example. My grandson came over and we were, I gave him special time over here. He was maybe six years old. So school age. And we took out a lot of stuff and played in the family room. And then, you know, special time was up and, and I said, could you help me pick stuff up? And he goes, no, I'm not going to help you pick stuff up. And I just let that be. I thought, I don't need to scold him. You know, I, I, I'm a grandma, so I can pick stuff up. It's not, you know, it's not hurting my heart to not have his help. Um, so, but what I did instead was I just said, oh, okay, we're not going to pick it up then. And I picked one, I think we had puppets out. I picked up one puppet and I just threw it in the air and he laughed. And I threw, and we, st I started throwing stuff around the room, just making a way bigger mess. And he laughed and laughed, and he started throwing stuff around the room too. And so, I don't know, for three minutes or four minutes, we just reveled in, you know, spreading the stuff all over the place. And then he, I just said, gave him a hug, and off he went. Um, and it was so interesting. And I just thought, well, at least I got a few laughs. I don't know if that did him any good. He came back the next day, <laughs> he walked in the house and he saw, you know, a bunch of stuff that hadn't been put away. He spent 10 minutes tidying things up around the house. I didn't say one word to him, but he tidied up here and he tidied up there. And he said, look, Mima, you know, I, I fixed this for you. And he just went around and just, you know, completely out of the goodness of his heart fixed stuff up and did stuff for me that I didn't even ask him to do. So it did make an impression. And, um, and I know that <laughs> we have one mom who's training with us to become an instructor. She has 
she's Olena, she's in Italy. She's got five children, two of whom are children with special needs, children with disabilities. And um, she just thought, you know, she has done the same thing. And so for a week, rather than picking things up, you know, their family just laughed and laughed and laughed while throwing things around. And she just thought, man, this is never going to turn into anything good. But just as she was about to give up on, you know, the idea of doing the opposite and letting children laugh and laugh and laugh about you allowing mess and encouraging mess, um, they started being cooperative. They started actually picking things up and doing things she asked. So sometimes you have to um, get some laughter going to help you connect around the issue that is the thorn in their side um, by being unusually permissive and unusually playful. So that's one way of going about it. Another way of going about it is just by holding the limit and saying, you know, no, these blocks really do need to be cleaned up. And, you know, I'm not going to let you run off and, and do anything else. You know, I can't make you clean them up, but I am, we're going to stay here until you find a way to do it. And I'll help. You can find a way that, you know, that I will help. And usually if children are carrying some big feelings that have disconnected them and made them obstinate, um, those feelings will come out if you just set the limit and pay attention and don't lecture and don't tell them all the reasons they should pick up and all the reasons they have to be part of the household. And, you know, if you just leave all that behind and you just say, no, nope, I can't let you go. I know you can figure out what to do with these blocks and I'll help, but you have to tell me how you want me to help. Well, I want you to do it all. Oh, no. Uh -uh. No, that's not a good idea. You know, we're going to do it together. You know, and they'll, they'll, they'll either cry and then come up with something or they'll come up with something that includes you. I think, I think it was my policy bringing up my kids that there was no chore that, that was that had to be done by yourself. So when I was doing stuff I didn't like, I could ask some one of them to help me. And when they were doing stuff they didn't like, they could ask me to help them because doing things together is much, much more fun than doing them by yourself. And I just don't, I don't like the whole feeling that I get when I'm sending someone off to do something they hate to do all by themselves. I'd rather go with them. Let's get it done twice as fast and together. And uh, I think helping one another is a better format for getting the stuff that we don't like to do done, then you've got to go off and do it by yourself. Thank you. It's great answers. Um, we have one that's actually really close to my heart. Um, Samira from London is asking if you can give any ideas on how to connect with your 24 year old son who has a lot of issues and refuses to open up. Okay. Um, when a person is 24, um, you cannot pry them open. Um, really some form of, of special time is probably the best idea. And I don't know what this would be. You kind of have to think about, you know, what have you done together in the past that has been fun? Um, what would, what does your son like to do that you would also like to do or that you would like to do with him? So tickets, tickets to a sports sporting event, tickets to a concert, um, you know, a favorite restaurant, um, just going out to eat a certain kind of food together. It doesn't have to be expensive or fancy, just um inviting someone to be with you to do something pleasant and then um just being pleased with who they are um, not trying to solve any problems not trying to pry just open and listening um that really is your your starting place i think and um Sometimes there are little traditions that a child used to like, um, like games they used to like to play when they were little. You know, if your kid was a, you know, loved Monopoly, then you want to, you know, get out the Monopoly and say, hey, we haven't played this in so long. I wonder if you're still as good at, you know, beating me as you used to be. And or sometimes getting out picture albums to take a look at together. Hey, I was thinking about 
what you were like when you were three. And I just found some really sweet pictures. Do you want to look at them together? Um, you can tell me what you remember. And um, those kinds of things where you're, you know, you're reaching back into traditions that were positive when your child was way younger. Um, those might those might work well. You know, um, and they actually do work well. I'm living proof of it. Um, with my 22 year old, uh, it was really insightful when we started doing. Uh, she lives down south, and we started doing a book club uh, together and just talked on the phone in regards to that. And she started sharing pictures of herself when she was little and me making comments on it. So it was, it was, it really does work even with older children. Um, so I have a couple more questions if you have a little bit more time. Um, and so one of the questions, and this seems to be a question that is uh, kind of asked several times, it, the parents understand the importance of one-on-one -on -one time with each of their children, um, but they need some practical suggestions on how to approach for larger families. This particular um, parent has seven kids and many days she just can't physically spend 10 minutes alone with each of them. So she tries to space it out, but that doesn't seem to work. So she's wondering if you might have some other tips for that. You know, um, we do have two instructors, or one, one instructor with eight children and another instructor-to-be who has five. Um, it is quite a challenge to have that many children and to be trying to find, you know, one-on-one -on -one time with each of them. Um, I think the first thing is getting listening time about how you wish you had more time or just listening time about I don't know, whatever your feelings are about having had to spread yourself so thin for so long. Uh, that will really help you see little opportunities here and there as they present themselves. So little spontaneous special times. Um, somehow, you know, three of the kids go swimming and so only, you know, only and one is off with a friend. And so there's, you know, just a few left at home and you know just saying hey guys i'd love to do special time um can you can can we you know have this part of the house for the special time part and i'd like to do 20 minutes each or um i, I don't know you just you kind of have to take opportunities as they arise um and or um pour in your caring and your attention um, at bedtime so that you're spending like 10 minutes with each of three children one night and 10 minutes with each of three children the next night and then 10 minutes with, you know, your seventh child and the first two, the third night, um, that kind of thing. It's not really special time because it's a certain time of day and they're in bed, but it is a connective time. So I wouldn't worry about, you know, if it's strictly special time, you can do whatever you want to do. That is really wonderful and not, not to be ignored. But in place of it, you know, 10 minutes lying with, you know, one of your children at bedtime is probably a good, a good substitute until you can find, you know, the, the time that you need. Maybe it, it would work better to do longer sets of time on the weekends. So you could do half an hour with one child on Saturday, half an hour with another child on Sunday. While if there's another parent in the picture, that parent manages the rest of the family um, and then cycle through the kids that way so they can look forward to their Saturday or their Sunday and, and you can mark it on the calendar. Um, let's see. I think what um, though our mom with eight children, um, four of them are grown. So she had four at home and one night she had, you know, one of them was gone, but she got home like at 1030 at night with her three daughters, one of whom is just had, she had early trauma. And so, you know, her feelings were all over the place and she was a, a, a quite a needy child. And um, so what she decided to do at 10.30 at night was 
10 minutes with each of her children and she targeted her neediest child first. And that child, you know, kind of jumped all around and did, you know, kind of crazy stuff that she just she would have usually, you know, said, no, you can't do that. No, honey, don't be so loud, da 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 she just let it happen. And within five minutes, her that daughter was crying with her about missing her and wanting her not to have a job that, you know, went until 10 o'clock at night. And so had a good five minute cry. And then she cycled her older child in. And the youngest child said, Mommy, I'll take care of the baby, which she had never done in her life before after this good you know, 10 minutes, five minutes of which was a good, sweet cry. So she took care of the baby. The older child had some special time. And then the older two put themselves to bed and she had special time with her littlest one. And by then it was almost 11 o'clock, but it was kind of a revolutionary evening because the middle child who was always so needy and wanting all the attention for herself actually turned and took care of the baby willingly and happily um, after her special time. So, um, and that, you know, that's not in every family every day that something like that happens, but um, just look for your opportunities where you can find them and cry. You could keep, keep offloading the feelings you have about I'm not enough because you clearly are enough. Your children are alive. They are well. You're feeding them. They've got a, a you know, you've got a big family to offer love and care and um, connection. So I don't know. Just working on feeling like you're not enough will help you be more confident when you do have time for your children and more confident that they may need sometimes to cry about never getting enough of your attention so that they can feel your love again. It's like children need to cry about those disappointments. Even if you have only one child, they are going to be disappointed about never having enough of you. And they need to cry that disappointment through so they get rid of it. It's out of their way and they can feel pleased with their life again. So um, I would say getting some support for yourself is part of the solution, of a, a pretty important part. Yeah. So um, Facebook Lives like this one where Patty's answering individual questions are built into this parent club. Um, and not only that, the parent club is a way to connect parents like you, all of you who are watching, in a supportive community so that you know and you're always reminded that you are enough. Um, I'm going to take one more question, but before we do this last question, I just want to remind people that we have – Two more Facebook Lives with Patty. Tomorrow at 3 p.m., uh, Patty's going to go over um, sibling rivalry. And then on um, Thursday, and that's Pacific Standard Time, and then Thursday at 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time, she's going to go over how to parent um, calmly and coolly. So we're looking forward that, to that. Um, on Friday, the 15th, we have two two-hour periods of time where myself and Julie are going to be interviewing parents who have um, experienced the life-changing um, experiences with Hand in Hand. So we're really looking forward to sharing that with all of you. So we are going to take one more question, and this is one that has been sent in. It's from Trisha. And she is asking, um, I'm saying, I'm trying to foster more of a sense of cooperation, problem solving, and working as a team with our family instead of using control. How would you handle an eight-year-old that has a sweet tooth and asks to have lots of treats? Okay. Um, you know, I, I'm... Let's see, this is not one of our listening tools, but I think family meetings are really a good idea um, because, you know, just one time a week or maybe every other week, however, however often you want to set it up, where, you know, each person gets listened to in the family by all the other people and where each person can say, you know, what, uh, what's something that went well this week for you and what's something you would like to, you, you think you'd like to have be better. And so the children can actually talk about what, you know, what they wish and what they want and uh, what's going well and what's hard and listen to each other. And you don't necessarily need to come up with any solutions. Uh, what you want to do is just set a tradition of everybody being heard by everybody. 
And once you've got the little family meetings going where it's really just, you know, put in the pot, whatever, whatever is on your mind. Um, so I would get that tradition going for three or four weeks first. And then you could say, um, you know, at, at, you know, the next family meeting, let's talk about treats and sweets. And what do you think we should do about treats and sweets? Everybody can say something and just have each of the children saying what they would like to have it be. And um, you're hoping, I mean, think what will come up is, you know, I want to eat cookie, as many cookies as I want. And I don't want anybody to tell me that I can't. And I think, you know, kids should be respected. And if they want to eat sweets, they should get to eat sweets. You're going to hear that. There's some version of that. And, um, I, you know, what, what you can say there is, I know you want to eat sweets. You know, they are made so you want them. And, um, and they are really, really yummy. And um, in order to keep you healthy, um, it's my job to, you know, have, have some say over how many sweets you eat. So let's figure out um, a way that we can... You know, let's let's try and you can just suggest an experiment. Let's try, you know, one cookie a day or one sweet a day or one sweet a week or whatever you think is your sort of, you know, ideal sweet allotment. Um, and um, we can have five minute special times where you I'm not going to try to control what you eat. And uh, <laughs> those can be, so when, when the five minute special time comes up, you know, guess what happens? The ice cream comes out of the refrigerator and your child is going to eat ice cream for five minutes or eat cookies for five minutes. It's like, it's going to be, you know, sweets galore. Um, and what will be helpful is that if you do a comic version of your reaction to them eating sweets. So you're, oh no, look at all that ice cream, you know, are you ever gonna live? You know, I wonder if you're gonna get a tummy ache. And so that it's actually fun and funny to be sort of defying the usual rules of the household. And, um, or, you know, they're downing one Oreo cookie after another and you're going, oh, please share the Oreo with me. Oh, please, I just want one little lick of the creamy stuff inside. You're just one little lick and they can go, uh-uh, it's my cookie. And, and you want it, I don't know, just you know, getting some humor going around sweets kind of relieves the tension and makes it easier for them to um, deal with the rules that apply, you know, the other 99.5% of the time. Um, you know, children can have a good cry over wanting ice cream just this once, just for tonight, just because I really want it. And those cries are very, very useful. It's like, I think, um, I mean, you know, it, it, <laughs> Certain foods are made to be addictive, and um, we need to help our children with those, with their wants and their desires um, by replacing our attention and our listening and our caring um, by pouring that in when they can't have the cookie they want or the ice cream they want or the, you know, amazing, you know, three scoop, you know ice cream sundae that they saw a picture of in the magazine, um, giving them a chance to cry about the thing they think they want and getting instead your caring and your love and your understanding that this is indeed hard. It is really hard to get what you don't want and what you want, you know, to not get what you want and pouring your love in there as a replacement for the ice cream or the cookie or the, you know, the candy cane. Um, is going to be surprisingly rewarding because when children are finished crying about the candy cane they didn't get or the ice cream they didn't get, um, the craving leaves their mind. It's like that. And they really don't care anymore um, most of the time. Or sometimes there's a little deal at the end. Well, you know, can we do a special time tomorrow so I can have a few bites? And you can go, sure and allow five minutes of, you know, the rules are off. Um, so that this makes, it turns out to give you a chance to be the good guy, a chance to play with their all of their cravings and get some laughter going around them. 
and a chance to feel kind of stronger and more loving and caring when you do need to set limits. And they need that. They need your confidence in order to cry fully about their cravings. They need you to not be wavering back and forth and feeling like, oh my gosh, am I really spoiling my relationship with my child because I don't give them ice cream every night after dinner? Um, no, you're not. If you're replacing the ice cream with your caring and your listening and your understanding, you're building a stronger relationship. And uh, I, I can tell you that for sure. So Patty, we're almost out of time, um, but I wanted to, first of all, thank you for giving us your time today and um, time with all of us. You're welcome. Um, the thing I'd love to do. <laughs> well, what, one thing we do in our organization, and you had mentioned it in your family meetings, was talk about um, one good thing. I would love if we could end um, with one good thing that happened with you today um, and then me. Oh, okay. Um, oh, one good thing. Well, I'll just tell you that. Um, I'll tell you one that happened a few days ago. <laughs> I was rubbing my grandson's back on the living room floor, and my granddaughter was going, rub me, rub me. You've been rubbing him for too long. Rub me. <laughs> and uh, they're teenagers. And so <laughs> I said, I'll be over to you in a little bit. And what she did was climb on top of his back, um, he had asked me to rub his butt and um, <laughs> his back and put her butt right in front of my hands. So then I had his butt on top of the other, and I was rubbing his butt with one hand and her butt with the other hand. And we were kind of making a few jokes. <laughs> and I said, um, gee, look at this. I have two butts here. And my grandson said to me as he's lying there with his head on his on his hands, he says, yes. And one of them is way more fantastic than the other. <laughs> it really cracked me up. <laughs> that is really funny. Well, well, my one good thing is that um, I get to work with someone as wonderful as you and got to spend an hour and a half listening to all the great things and share all the great things. So um, I'm looking forward to tomorrow at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And for those of you who would love to um, be able to see Patty um, more often, uh, please join us in the Hand in Hand Parent Club. Um, this membership gives you the absolute best information that we have to offer. And it's delivered to your inbox every day. And you get live question and answer sessions with Patty um, at least four to, every four to five weeks. Um, and it's all accessible by your phone. So we will see you tomorrow at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time when we talk about sibling rivalry. So bye, everyone. Have a great day. Bye.